Welcome back. Now we'll talk about sources of nitrogen fertilizer. We've started talking about this a little bit um, in the previous section, but we're going to get into a little more detail now. Uh, just kind of a refresher, let's look at some of our uh, different nitrogen fertilizer materials in this chart. Uh, we have, uh, or I should say table, we have uh, anhydrous uh, ammonia, urea, ammonium nitrate, UAN solutions, that's urea ammonium nitrate, and then ammonium sulfate. And here's the chemical formula. And it's important to, to know the analysis of uh, these materials. Uh, some of them have higher analysis than, than other materials, and with UAN solutions, uh, it's important to uh, pay attention whether you're going to be using 28% or 32%. And uh, we can see both products here in Wisconsin. And this is just uh, showing the percentage of nitrogen in each form. Uh, and just as a reminder, as we talked about uh, before, uh, UAN solutions, they are our, our complex form of N since we have urea, ammonium, and nitrate. Now when we uh, look at some of uh, the materials, here we have a, a listing of the physical form that we typically are using them in. Uh, now urea is considered dry pellets, but you could also make a solution with that if you wished. Uh, and you have you obviously your UAN solutions. Uh, we have our different methods of application uh, that can occur. Uh, and this is something that, that you can read and, and should be probably pretty obvious to many of you. Now, I am often asked questions such as, are there differences in nitrogen sources? Well, <laughs> you know, there are different loss mechanisms uh, for each material. Some are more prone to leaching, others uh, more prone to denitrification, you know, if there's a lot of nitrate in them ammonia volatilization for our urea materials. Uh, but, you know, essentially if we can control nitrogen losses, do a really good job of application, uh, they should be uh, relatively comparable to each other. And we know that that doesn't always uh, ring, th ring true, uh, but it really probably is more an issue with application method and, and our ability to control those loss mechanisms. And I'm not going to go into details of that because I think we've talked enough about the nitrogen cycle and you could look at the forms of N in the different fertilizer materials and be thinking about uh, where, where you might see some differences. So that gets me on to uh, controlling uh, N losses. Um, one of the things, this is kind of a, an, an all-in-one slide, there's a, a compilation of a lot of stuff here, and so I'm not going to go into extreme detail on, on any of it. Uh, so now, if we think about uh, source of nitrogen, uh, and we want to control losses, uh, if we're going to do fall applications, which may not be the best thing in Wisconsin, because we can't always control uh, the amount of rainfall we get through the late fall, winter, and early spring, and that can influence uh, losses of nitrogen. Uh, but we would want to use ammonium-based forms of N or <clears throat> anhydrous ammonia uh, because it's you have to convert from ammonium to nitrate because remember nitrate's what can be lost. Uh, on uh, timing of applications also important. Uh, when we again sort of the source comes into you know fall applications, but uh, when we look at timing on sandy soils, we really want to use side dress N applications. Uh, to avoid some of those losses with, with pre-plant applications. Sometimes multiple side dress applications may be beneficial. And we don't want to apply fall uh, commercial nitrogen fertilizer in the fall. Uh, that's typically not a good idea uh, because of the high leaching potential of sandy soils. Now on our, our poorly drained uh, medium and fine textured soils, uh, we might want to consider side dressing as our main option uh, to avoid some of the uh, uh, denitrification and leaching losses that may occur uh, earlier in the spring uh, when we have um, heavier rainfalls. <clears throat> and again with fall application uh, for any source of nitrogen or or manure, and again we really want to be putting on ammonium N in the fall, wait until soil temps are less than 50 degrees. I think that uh, uh, graph I showed earlier is, is very clear. We can still have uh, nitrification occurring at lower soil temperatures below 50, so let's at least wait till we're at soil temps less than 50 in the fall. 
Now, when we think about uh, placement, one of the key things for controlling loss is with placement is related to urea application. Uh, we really need to get that urea incorporated uh, to limit the volatilization losses. Now, we can do that with uh, tillage uh, or injection. Uh, another way uh, would be rainfall. And if we can get about a quarter inch of rain within two days of application, that's going to typically uh, limit the amount of uh, ammonia volatilization losses from surface applied urea, particularly in the springtime. Now, uh, when we think about controlling losses and, and, our, uh, and rate as a factor in that, uh, we need to keep in mind if you uh, don't want, you do not want to apply nitrogen at rates greater than what the crop is going to use. Uh, because if the crop's not going to use it, it's going to be left over and it will get lost. That's a guarantee. Very rarely will it be sticking around. So keeping rates uh, in a range that are going to be needed by the crop. Uh, excess application is never useful for controlling end losses. And again, these are just hitting some real high points uh, here. Now to go into some uh, examples uh, of the effect of timing and UAN application, here we have uh, corn grain yield and nitrogen recovery at Hancock, Wisconsin. So this is a sandy soil. And so with our timing of applications, we have pre-plant, side dress, uh, side dress, uh, plus four weeks after side dress, and side dress plus another application eight weeks after that initial side dress. And the percentage of the nitrogen of the total and applied is shown here and broken down. So in this bottom uh, treatment, there was 17% of the N was applied pre-plant, 50% at side dress, and then at the four-week timing, four weeks after side dress and eight weeks after side dress, there was each 17%. Now the total N application uh, for each treatment was 210 pounds of N per acre, all as UAN solution. And this was done in two years, and you can see the yields and for both, and then the recovery of nitrogen. Uh, and that was measured by uh, looking at the whole, whole plant at the end of the, the growing season at physiological maturity, uh, measuring the biomass and the nitrogen content in there, and seeing how much how does that compare to the amount of fertilizer and applied? So one thing uh, that becomes obvious is with these uh, four split applications of, of nitrogen, we have our greatest recovery. Uh, our yield is, you know, about the same for many of these, for these particular years that this was done, uh, but we had our best nitrogen recovery. So you could say that that, that was the most end use efficient, or, we had, or sorry, had our greatest recovery. Uh, and then any individual treatment, you can see some differences between years uh, with regard to N recovery. Uh, so splitting N tends to be a very good thing to control N losses on sandy soils. So that brings me to nitrogen stabilizers and extenders. Uh, these are products uh, that can be added to fertilizer uh, nitrogen materials. And before we really get into some of the details on that, I think it's really important to have some uh, truth in advertising here. Uh, just because a salesperson says that a nitrogen stabilizer extender works doesn't mean it actually works, okay? That's unfortunate, but it's out there. Uh, so you, what you want to do is you want to ask to see independent university data, uh, ask your extension agent or specialist for help. Uh, maybe a product hasn't been worked on in, in your state, but maybe there's some really nice data uh, from a, another state adjacent, and your the specialist can help you find that uh, information. Now, another important thing to consider is even when you have a stabilizer or extender that is uh, genuine, it's been demonstrated to work, that using that in all situations is completely inappropriate, okay? You need to know when to use that material uh, because everything costs something and you don't want to be paying for a product that you don't need and is not doing anything. Um, and the key here is, uh, you know, you don't want to use it all the time, especially if you think you are guaranteed an increase because with any of these products, you are not guaranteed an increase. They're essentially an insurance product to help uh, try and hold nitrogen uh, in the ammonium form or slowly release it so that it's not available for loss in the nitrate form. And unless you have weather conditions that are going to promote 
nitrate loss, you may not actually see an economic benefit to it. So it might be more of a preventative that maybe you need that uh, insurance risk, or maybe you need that insurance and maybe you don't, but you'll never really know because we can't really predict the weather very well. And I do want to say that I believe that stabilizers and extenders have a place in some situations. It's just not all situations and not all products work. So what are nit nitrogen extenders or stabilizers? There's a lot of different terminology uh, that's sometimes used. And I think we just need to boil this down to kind of three main things. And that's urease inhibitors, nitrification inhibitors, and slow release materials. And so you can think of these uh, like you might think of with herbicides as a mode of action. These are the mode of actions. It's what part of the nitrogen cycle they're trying to uh, work with. And so again, it's critical to know your mode of action. I think one of the biggest uh, problems that I see as I talk with ag agronomists uh, throughout the state is that they're uncertain about a particular product's mode of action. Uh, they're not sure, is it a nitrification inhibitor or is it a urease inhibitor? And sometimes it's just we get sloppy way of talking so that uh, we get confused. And other times, uh, you know, some products um, make claims for multiple modes of action, so then it kind of starts muddying the water. So you just that need to be really clear and really do your homework. So here's some common nitrogen stabilizers that uh, can be uh, purchased here in Wisconsin. It's not an exhaustive list uh, by any means, but these are products that have had known efficacy when used appropriate, and situations for end loss exist. So the first product we have is Agritain. This is, the active ingredient is NBPT. This is a urease inhibitor. Then we have Agritain Plus, okay? So this is uh, Agritain Plus Dicyan Diamine, or DCD. And DCD is a nitrification inhibitor. So here we have a dual action, uh, dual mode of action product. We're inhibiting urease and nitrification. Now Super U, uh, this product is also made by Agritain. Uh, it has MBT, BPT and DCD as well. Uh, Agritain Plus is going to be to use in UAN solutions. Super U is a dry product. It's uh, manufactured, the, the nitrification and urease inhibitors are made within the melt of the urea. It has a uh, very pretty robin's egg blue color to it. So it looks distinctly different than urea. Uh, then we have NSERV. It's been around for a long time. It's nitropyrin. It's a nitrification inhibitor uh, typically used with anhydrous ammonia. Then we have Instinct. Uh, this is also nitropyrin, but it's an encapsulated form of it. And this is a, a newer form uh, that's been out probably uh, five, six years now perhaps. Uh, and it also, again, is a nitrification inhibitor. It can be used with UAN solutions. It can be coated onto urea as well. And then we have uh, ESN. Uh, and this is, uh, we don't have an active ingredient because there sort of isn't really an active ingredient, but its mode of action is it's a poly-coated urea. It's a slow release uh, material. It relies on uh, water, uh, the, having adequate temperature and moisture t for that poly-coat to become porous to allow water to move in, start dissolving their urea, and the urea to move out of the poly-coat. Uh, so that's how that uh, particular product works. As I said, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the, the most common ones uh, that are out there. So when we start thinking about do I need an inhibitor or don't I need an inhibitor, it is really important to know your nitrogen cycle. What we spent uh, a, a lot of time talking about earlier today, uh, that you have a, a good knowledge of what's happening in, in your soil. Uh, so for example, a urease inhibitor, you're going to use that with urea fertilizer materials because you want to prevent the volatilization losses. If you're not applying urea, there's no need for a urease inhibitor. If you're incorporating that urea, okay, so you say you broadcast urea but then you're incorporating it, there's also no need for a urease inhibitor because it's in the soil, you're not going to volatilize it. And that's one of the biggest uh, mistakes I think I've seen. Uh, with the use of uh, urease inhibitors is that uh, they're applied with uh, urea materials that are being incorporated because the, the farmer didn't understand that uh, they don't need it when they're incorporating. If they're not incorporating, uh, then they do need it. And then 
uh, when we're looking at nitrification inhibitors, here's what we're limiting here, this conversion from ammonium to nitrate. And slow release materials means that getting nitrogen into this ammonium pool, it just moves more slowly. It's not like just dropping in urea, it's going to be a slower release. Now again, these urease inhibitors, we'll talk about them for a little bit more. Uh, they're temporarily going to stop the conversion of ammonium, uh, uh, conversion of urea to ammonium. And you get about a seven day uh, window with agrotane. So that means uh, if you have surface broadcast, you're not going to incorporate. You're relying on rainfall to do that incorporation. Instead of having a two day window where you need a quarter inch of rain, it, you can push that seven, maybe 10 days. Um, and if we think about spring applications of surface applied urea in Wisconsin, there's probably a pretty good chance we're going to get a quarter inch of rain within a week or 10 days. Uh, so that's where it, it really has its best use, surface applied urea or uh, UAN solutions that would be surface applied. Now this uh, table is showing a compilation of data. So it's a, essentially a meta-analysis where they looked at a number of studies. Uh, so it was a total of, uh, had a total of 78 sites over a number of studies. Uh, within that, uh, they had urea was applied or UAN was applied. And what you're seeing here is the yield increase where these materials were applied with uh, uh, agrotain versus without. And agrotain is NBPT. So this is the uh, yield advantage, so to speak, of agrotain. And so when all the sites were evaluated, there were 78 total. And we could see a 4.3 bushel yield advantage when it's used with urea, only 1.6 with UAN. Now if we looked at all the sites that were N-responsive, that was 64. So the difference between these two, between all and N-responsive, means that there was 14 sites where there was no response to N. Okay, so it's probably more important to look at sites where it was N-responsive. And here we could see larger increases where agrotain was used. And then if we uh, look at the sites where they were deemed as only having a significant ammonium loss, potential for ammonium losses, okay, or ammonia losses, uh, that was 59 sites. And here again now, uh, with urea, we've seen another a little increase in the, our yield, and UAN is probably not different when it's just N-responsive. And, you know, this really uh, makes sense that we have a bigger yield response when uh, agrotain is applied with urea versus UAN. And the reason being is that urea is all urea, so that urease inhibitor is protecting all of it from potential volatilization losses. Whereas with UAN, only 50% of the urea is, only 50% of the nitrogen is urea. Uh, so that means the urease inhibitor is only protecting 50%, because only 50% of it could have been volatilized. Uh, so it would make sense that you would have uh, reduced yield increases, and they're about half or so of urea, and you only have half of your N as urea in UAN. So that kind of makes sense. So this is showing that when you have situations for ammonia volatilization with surface applied urea, agrotain uh, would be a useful uh, tool to help control those N losses. Now moving on to nitrification inhibitors. Uh, what's happening here is we're temporarily stopping the conversion of ammonium to nitrate. And I'm going to show you a, a series of of slides from, uh, that show some of our research plots uh, over the past few years. And uh, with all this most recent uh, research, we're looking at instinct, so that's nitropyrin, so it's that, the newer form of nitropyrin that's encapsulated. And in this particular study at Arlington, it was conducted in 2008 to 2010 each year on a well-drained silt loam. We used UAN as the nitrogen source. The previous crop to corn was soybean. And so here we had uh, two N rates, uh, and we're showing the mean of the two N rates where we had with or without instinct. And you can see the, the yield levels here. In 2008 and 10, we have a, about five bushel increase where we used instinct compared to without. But statistically, we can't say that's significant. So from a statistical standpoint, these numbers would need to be 0 0.10 or less. So we can't say that it, it didn't do it, but it was five bushel difference. Now, 2008 and 10 were both quite wet uh, years at uh, the Arlington Research Station. Here's showing the rainfall departure from normal in May, June, and July. 
And if we look at 2008, uh, we can see that particularly in June, we have 9.6 inches uh, more rain than normal in June of 2008. In July, we had more rain than normal, uh, but occurred in June and uh, July, so kind of late June into July. Now specifically uh, in the 2008 growing season, we had somewhere in the, the range of about 10 inches of rain uh, between planting and side dress application timing. And uh, that's a lot of rain, and that's much more uh, than, than usual. And uh, a large part of that, I forget the amount, but a large amount of, of that 10 inches occurred in about a three or four day time period. So we really got hit hard uh, with rain. And so even on this well-drained silt loam soil, it was uh, wet. And um, one of the other components of the study that's kind of interesting is we had a full set of end rates, zero to 200 pounds, uh, where we applied pre-plant, uh, and then another set where we applied side dress, and that's uh, not counting these uh, pre-plant applications uh, of this uh, with or without uh, instinct. And when we look at the full set of end rates and the yield response curve, uh, that we can get, remember we, we'll look at this with, on a graph with uh, nitrogen rate being on the bottom of the graph and the left side of the graph will have uh, yield. And remember those are yield increases with end rate and then flattens off. So we see that, that kind of a, a curve. And we can fit models to that to calculate the economic optimum end rate. And when we do that, in 2008, we, had, we needed 30 pounds less N if we side dress compared to pre-planted. And in 2010, we needed 40 pounds less N if we side dress compared to pre-plant. Uh, so, and in 2009, it was 10 pound difference. We actually needed only 10 pounds more at pre-plant. That's not enough to get excited about, okay? 10 pounds is it. 30 and 40 pounds, that's uh, a significant amount uh, more N that's required at pre-plant compared to side dress, again, because we were losing some of that N with the heavy rainfall. So while our statistics uh, up here, when we were comparing specifically with and without instinct, says, well, those five bushels, we couldn't say that they're statistically uh, different, uh, but it did seem the instinct did a little better. Here, the, the, with the weather data and then how uh, a full end response with pre-plant and side dress uh, suggests that th th those were probably yield, uh, real and instinct probably was, was doing something. Now to uh, look at another study at Arlington. Here we had, uh, this slide is urea, but the next one is going to be manure. Uh, so here uh, we had uh, fall or spring application of 100 pounds of urea. So we were going for uh, an N rate that was going to be, um, this is 100 pounds of N per acre, not 100 pounds of urea. So we're going for a somewhat N deficient uh, rate so we can see uh, differences better if something's going to show up with, uh, with or without instinct. And here we can see our yields uh, for grain yield, instinct, no versus yes, uh, the mean of the fall versus spring, and then uh, for silage yield. This is a tons of dry matter. And we come down and look at our statistics. Bottom line here uh, is that uh, we had a significant effect of instinct on both grain yield and silage yield. So it, significant, so it significantly increased uh, grain and silage yield. Now, in this study, we also were looking at dairy manure. And so we had fall application of dairy manure or spring application. I don't have the manure applications listed. They were a slight, little, little bit different between fall and spring. So uh, while I have a mean shown, uh, you know, we need to be looking at individual um, application timings as well. And, but we didn't see a, an a effect of timing, whether it was fall or spring, as far as an interaction with instinct. And that's important. So, we, so from that standpoint, while the N application rate might have been slightly different between fall and spring dairy manure application, um, the effect was similar. And when we look at instinct, there was no effect on uh, grain yield. So even though uh, we've got a 14 bushel increase, we could not say that that was significant. There's just enough variability in the data. When we look at silage yield, there was a significant increase where instinct was applied, uh, 7.97 tons per acre versus 7.2. Uh, so we are seeing that effect. Now to look at uh, some data, some uh, data from another study, 
uh, and we're looking at uh, instead of looking at yield we're going to look at soil nitrate and ammonium concentrations here's a study that was done in 2012 at our Marshfield Ag Research Station so this is a uh, probably a withy silt loam. It's a somewhat poorly drained soil, uh, although I would argue it seems like it's more poorly drained than somewhat poorly drained. Um, and what we did here is we're looking at our time of application, which was either no, none because we had no uh, nitrogen, or it was pre-plant timing and we had urea or UAN as the source. Uh, we're looking at two rates where uh, nitrogen was supplied with or without instinct, uh, and they're 100 and 120 pounds. Uh, the numbers might be a little bit different, beca but because there was no interaction, we were able to combine them together to make just an average. And here we're looking at uh, nitrate and ammonium in pounds of N per acre for both of these, uh, where we did not apply instinct versus where we did apply it, and then also compared to where there was just no uh, N applied at all. And uh, we can see that there's no significant differences with uh, nitrate concentrations in the soil. This is a one foot soil sample, so this would be uh, like at the pre cydrus nitrate timing. And then here, if we look at ammonium, there's a significant increase in ammonium where instinct was applied uh, with urea. And also with UAN, we saw another significant increase in ammonium where UAN was applied. Now, that's saying that the instinct is holding the nitrogen in the ammonium form. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So now if we have events that are going to cause either leaching or denitrification losses, we've got more of it in the ammonium form. Now if we never have an event that causes leaching or denitrification, and we likely uh, d did not in 2012 because then it turned dry after this early part of the season, we might not see a yield difference, but soil-wise this is saying the product is working. Now, statistically, uh, the nitrate numbers are not different from one another, but they do show the same trend that makes sense in that there's less nitrate where instinct was applied compared to where it was not applied. And that makes sense when you're having more uh, ammonium. Uh, so uh, we can do studies like this where we can verify uh, that the product is, is working. Whether you see the yield benefit, uh, that's always you know, at the mercy of the weather and how that's going to go that year. Now, uh, here's an, a little bit older study uh, from the 90s uh, looking at the effect of nitrification inhibitors on corn yield. Um, and here, this is at the Hancock Research Station. So this is moving into a sandy soil. And here you're looking at the four-year average. Now, all treatments had 140 pounds of N per acre. So that's an N deficient rate, uh, again, because we wanted to see what the differences were with and without the inhibitor. Uh, and this was a DCD that would have been applied here. Uh, we have the timing of application was pre-plant versus side dress. And so we have pre-plant applications with no inhibitor. Yield was 116 bushels. Where we applied, uh, where we applied inhibitor, it was pre-plant, we increased yield to 121. That says that's good, the inhibitor worked. But what if we side dressed with no inhibitor? We had 134 bushel yield. If we side dress with inhibitor, still 134 bushels that didn't help. Now we had improved recovery uh, with side dressing uh, here compared to the pre-plant applications. And so the bottom line of this story is really here in this orange box that on sandy soil, side dress applications are preferred to use of nitrification inhibitors with pre-plant application. Uh, you know, in, in side dress application, you may not really need an inhibitor because uh, you know, the crop's at a point where it's using a, a lot of N at that point in time. Uh, so on sandy soils, our better management tool is really side dressing as opposed to use of an inhibitor. Uh, this slide uh, summarizes uh, in a very general sort of way the soil type essentially summarizes the probability that you might see a yield benefit from using a nitrification inhibitor. So here we have our uh, soil types. And on sands and loamy sands, uh, we have our time of application. Uh, fall application of nitrogen on sands and loamy sands, not recommended. If we spring pre-plant, uh, then we can expect a good uh, response to use of inhibitor. If we spring side dress, probably not very useful. Uh, and you can see we can go down through all of these. And we move into our silt loam soils, clay loams, essentially medium and fine texture type soils. Uh, we can go from well-drained 
uh, where we have a fair chance of uh, a, a positive yield response to use of an inhibitor, nitrification inhibitor specifically, if we fall apply. Typically, not so good of a chance with spring, either pre-plant or side dress. Um, and that, this is the historically what we'd say. Now, I do have data from a couple years that says that, well, we can get some positive responses even in the spring if it's really wet. Uh, but this is under typical conditions. Uh, so this is just a chart that you can look at and think about how it might help you in considering uh, whether a nitrification inhibitor would be appropriate for uh, the type of soil you're on and the timing of N application. So that moves us to slow release materials. Uh, again, as I discussed a little bit before, these are uh, products like ESN, a polycoated material that rely on uh, the coat uh, to get warm and with a little moisture become porous to allow other moisture in to dissolve the material and come out. Uh, something like a sulfur coated urea would be another slow release uh, material. And here's uh, some other data from our Hancock uh, research station where we're looking at the uh, nitrogen source. So we have a control, a polycoated urea, which was ESN in this particular study, uh, or ammonium sulfate. Uh, ammonium sulfate is a nice source of N because it's all ammonium and uh, there's no volatilization losses uh, and it has to be transformed to nitrate before it can be um, uh, lost. So it sometimes is used as a, uh, a check uh, like it was done here. The timing of N application, um, there was a lot more treatments in the study and I've just pulled out the ones that are, are relevant for making uh, the, the point here. Uh, there was pre-plant applications, there was pre-plant uh, plus four weeks after uh, uh, pre-planting. Uh, with ammonium sulfate, there was pre-plant pre -plant plus DCD nitrification inhibitor. And then there was a treatment that was just uh, side dress applications, no pre-plant, just uh, four and eight weeks after planting. And there was uh, three years of this study uh, that are summarized here. In a particular year, uh, yields with different letters are significantly different from one another. So in 2003, there was no significant difference amongst any of these treatments, but we did see some differences here in 2004. And uh, to step back and uh, look at all this data, uh, kind of to boil it down, um, is that years with normal or less than normal rainfall, ESN is equal to or better than side dressing or split ammonium sulfate applications or urea. Okay, but if you have years with excessive rainfall, uh, DCD did not provide uh, much benefit in this study. ESN was, pre-plant pre application of ESN was uh, better than other nitrogen sources applied pre-plant. However, split applications of ammonium sulfate, uh, specifically where it's split side dress applications, uh, were better than pre-plant ESN. So, you know, even in a wet year, pre-plant ESN did pretty good compared to other pre-plants, but still on sandy soils, you're going to perhaps do your best from reducing end losses to keeping it to side dress applications. Now, I have some uh, data from Iowa looking at uh, more silt loam type soils and the use of ESN. Uh, here we have three locations in three years, fall urea, fall ESN, and then spring urea. And so within a year, uh, if a yield has a, an asterisk, it means it was significantly greater than the other uh, treatments. So in 2003, fall ESN did better than fall urea and also spring urea. Uh, no differences in 2004, again, a wet, typically wet year. 2005, uh, we had the best yields with spring urea, and they were better than fall or fall ESN or fall urea. So here, even ESN in the fall didn't do a, a particularly good job. Now another study, again, uh, more silt loam soils, uh, these are all spring applied uh, ESN or urea. Uh, there's a, a few different locations here. Uh, we've got uh, over three different years. And uh, within a location, if there's an asterisk, that means there was a significant difference between the treatments. Uh, so ESN uh, actually did a little bit worse than urea at this particular location. The other three locations we had significantly better yield with ESN compared to urea. 
Uh, this location, there wasn't statistical significance, but ESN was better. Uh, so uh, here again, uh, this is showing that ESN applied in a, a pre-plant um, can be a, a useful material on silt loam soils uh, as it's slowly releasing N and keeping it from uh, being lost. And with that, we'll take a bit of a break and we'll move on to the next section. Mm -hmm.